Um, we're talking today about 40 years ago in the early days of the journalism program here at the university. I wasn't privy to the arrival of the wonderful idea, and I heard it had a somewhat uncertain birth. The program, as Bill Rowley conceived it, was pragmatic, professional, idealistic, literary, and peppered with journalists from the real world of news reporting. This opposed an idea that was on the table in the English department to present it as a textbook course with possible excursions into municipal history, the history of journalism, and who knows what else. I don't know those details, never heard them even back then. Bill's idea prevailed. I don't know why, but he was a persuasive and insistent fellow. But he also wanted his students to not only step lively into their journalistic careers after graduation, but also to be educated in history, politics, literature, and above all, to have learned how to write when they did so. Bill was my colleague in the 1950s when we were on opposition Albany newspapers. He on the Knickerbocker News, a Gannett paper, and me on the Times Union, a Hearst paper. We covered stories together, and I always admired Bill's intelligent reporting. One day, the two of us interviewed James Van Fleet, the general of the Korean War, at the Albany airport after he had left his command in Korea, and a picture of the three of us appeared in the next day's paper. I don't remember anything Bill or I wrote about that day because the picture has blocked out all talk of war and that interview of a historical moment is now about our hats. The general wore a dark Hamburg. Bill and I wore reportorially stylish fedoras. I invoked the memory of these images in my speech when Bill retired from teaching in 1984. I wrote the speech as a news story and I'll quote you my lead. At his retirement party yesterday at Alumni House on the campus of State University at Albany, William E. Rowley, veteran newsman and professor of journalism, was not wearing a hat. What I didn't know about Bill Beck when we were on the papers was that he was very slowly taking off his reporter's hat after all his years in journalism to become a teacher. The story goes that one day he told his managing editor at the Nick News that he was getting ready to leave the paper to teach at the brand new State University. His editor smiled but then wondered a bit condescendingly, did Bill really have any academic chops? Bill always low key said he sort of did. A BA from Harvard, taught history at Amherst, now finishing his PhD dissertation, also Harvard, and then off he went, away from the ink-stained wretches in the city room into the tweedy corridors of the university's English department. After a few years of teaching English as a journal, as a journal uh, and a journalism seminar, Bill in 1973 designed an expanded plan for a second field in journalism, 18 credits to begin in the spring semester of 74. He admitted this might seem somewhat vocational, but it would be executed in the context of a liberal arts education. Bill's field was his history, and his marvelous Harvard dissertation on the immigrant Irish as they lived in Albany between 1820 and 1880 is a scrupulous piece of reporting and also an illumination of the politics and class con conflicts of that age. He brought reporters, editors, and TV people to his class on some days mounting exposés of corrupt Albany politicians, but by semester's end bringing in some of those targeted politicians to let students attack them with questions and give the Pauls a chance to rebut. Bill was politically frantic, probably the most ardent fan ever of I.F. Stone, the independent political pamphleteer. He was a radical on Vietnam, a civil rights fanatic, and at age 89, he was still teaching writing and history to convicts in the Koksaki prison and attending anti-war rallies in his wheelchair. In late 1973, a few months before the second field in journalism made its debut, Bill asked me to teach a class in this department. I'd been a journalist since high school, wrote four and became editor of my college paper and magazine, spent three years as a sports writer columnist, one year in Glens Falls, and two years on an army weekly in Germany during the Korean War. 
I then worked seven years as a reporter, columnist, and sometimes city editor in Albany, San Juan, and Miami. I became the Time Life correspondent in Puerto Rico in the late 50s and wound up managing editor of a new newspaper there. That was a San Juan Star, which published its first edition November 2nd, 1959. I quit the editorship in 1961 to work half-time, and some people thought I'd been demoted. But I was desperate for time to write the novel I'd started, and I found I couldn't write and also run a newspaper. I stayed on as weekend editor, and then in 1963, for family reasons, quit the star and moved back to Albany, took another half-time job in my old paper, The Times Union, as a feature writer. I worked seven years writing whatever took me by the throat historicizing Albany's neighborhoods, muckraking about slums, civil rights, black power, the rise of the black voice in Albany, the federal poverty program and how it was changing Albany and America, and the life of street bums. I also interviewed the area's literati, and I anointed myself as a movie critic in order to attend the New York Film Festival. And I wrote about movies for two years. But my most enduring undertaking in the 60s was the chronicling the Albany Democratic political machine run in those days by two men, the working class Irish American political boss, Dan O'Connell, who by getting elected as a city assessor in 1919, in effect founded the new Democratic Party that took City Hall in 1921 and has never let go of it, the longest running political organization in the history of the world. Dan remained party leader until he died in 1977. Then Dan's mayor took over, Erastus Corning II, longest running mayor in American history, 11 consecutive terms from 1941 to 1983, and he left office the only way Democrats of that era were ever persuaded to do so, feet first. My ongoing subject in my journalism, my fiction, and one of my plays for more than 45 years has been these Democrats but also their enemies, the fangless and moribund Republicans who, with about five exceptions, have elected nobody worth electing since Warren Harding and the dawn of Prohibition. By the time Bill Rowley hired me to teach, I had left the Times Union and become a freelance writer for major magazines and, a, and the book critic for Look magazine. I published one novel, The Ink Truck, in 1969 and was under contract for another, Legs, which would be published in 1975, the year after I began teaching in this department. My course was advanced journalism, magazine writing, and the new journalism. I thought of it as literary journalism, not critical analysis, a writing workshop. Students had to write eight stories a semester, and I used two texts, a fine one that Bill was using called The Treasury of Great Reporting. Treasury of Great Reporting, is that better? Edited by Louis Snyder and Richard Morris, and also the new journalism, is that all right? Am I getting feedback now? A Treasury of Great Reporting, a great book. Edited by Louis Snyder and Richard Morris, and also the new journalism as codified by Tom Wolfe. I urge students to read and maybe emulate news stories written by Dickens, Mark Twain, Stephen Crane, Kipling, H.L. Mencken, Damon Runyon, Hemingway, Ernie Pyle, and A.J. Liebling. Also the so-called new journalists, among them Gay Talese, Michael Herr, Truman Capote, Hunter Thompson, Joan Didion, and Tom Wolfe himself. I added a few stories that I favored. James Agee was the author of one, Lillian Ross of another, and Norman Mailer, and then the greatest of all sports writers, Red Smith. We also explored the reigning heroes of the day, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, who had spurred great student interest in their investigative reporting, which had brought down Richard Nixon and 40 members of his administration over the Watergate burglary and other dirty tricks. Wolf had championed the new journalist as Huns, invaders who had come charging into our era with the first new direction of in American literature in a half a century, and he said they were dethroning the novel as the number one literary genre. Damn it all, Saul, Wolf wrote, the Huns have arrived. He meant Saul Bellow, one of the reigning novelists of that age. 
Wolf argued that the new journalists had taken over the 60s and forced the literary world for the first time to regard fiction as an artistic form. Also, he felt that the novelists had abandoned social realism as practiced in novels by writers such as Emile Zola. This was all overstatement, but the Huns definitely shook up journalism and opened it to new methods of writing news and nonfiction. Wolf summed up the Hun method in four devices. One, scene-by-scene scene construction of a story in the way fictional stories are traditionally told. Two, recording the dialogue of people in the story as fully as possible. Three, using a third-person point of view with scenes unfolding through the mind and emotional reaction of particular characters. Four, using status details, the characters, gestures, phrases, clothing, behavior, poses, walking styles, servants, furniture, etc., all symbols of their status life. These methods generated a band of oppositionists who mistrusted fictional type news stories because they sounded like fiction. And there was a long history of fake stories even among notable journalists like H.L. Mencken and Ben Hecht. Also, how could the reporter possibly know what emotions a character was experiencing? <coughs> Wolf offered a suggestion. Ask him what he was thinking and feeling and then write it. <coughs> Excuse me. I liked Wolf's book and so did my students. They felt freed from tradition, which is what I wanted them to feel, for that's what I'd been pursuing since I'd been began reporting, to lift the story out of the ordinary whenever possible, make it new, funny, urgent, make its tone and impact grow out of the story's content, whether it's a fire that trapped and killed three young children, the expose of a slumlord, a rambunctious governor on the stump for re-election, or the funeral of a saloon cat. Gay Talese wrote articles that read like short stories. Hunter Thompson delivered his stories like nobody else, broke all the molds and created a school of imitators who all fizzled out. He was inimitable. Mailer also made himself the center of almost everything he wrote and became a stellar and singular journalistic presence in the last half of the 20th century. He was brilliant and also inimitable, and no one since he stopped reporting has occupied his chair as America's major public intellectual. My students were challenged by all this freedom of form and style and they did step out even before graduation as interns on local papers and then as reporters. At one point we had students at the Nick News, the Times Union and 10, I say 10, on the Troy Record. We call that the Alumni Center. Some went on to major papers, the New York Times, Newsday, the LA Times, Chicago Trib, Time Magazine, Forbes, and so on. Some published nonfiction books and novels, and some ran or run magazines or newspapers or TV stations still. I've lost track of all their achievements. But the world has changed spectacularly since I stopped teaching here in 1982. And it's a whole new planet for students aspiring to journalism today. Times have been disastrously tough for newspapers, which was the only part of the planet where I truly wanted to work. Most afternoon papers have disappeared all across the country. All papers are in decline, and there's no relief in sight. Only hopeful online transformations of the traditional form into something new that makes money. Major papers in Los Angeles Times, Baltimore Sun, and Boston Globe have been sold recently to local owners at a huge loss, and the buyers may be buying some of them for their real estate value. And the Graham family sold the Washington Post for $250 million, a nifty price, to Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, who said that almost all print newspapers will be extinct in 20 years. So why did he buy it? All these papers had heavy downward trends in advertising rev revenue. The post down 44% in six years. TV networks have catastrophically diminished their foreign coverage. 
CBS in 1970 had 14 major foreign bureaus, 10 mini bureaus and stringers in 44 countries. But by 2005, they had only three bureaus and eight foreign correspondents, four of them in London doing voiceovers for video feeds from the AP and Reuters. And all the TV networks seem to have slid into the swamp of celebrity and are paying homage to entertainment values that diminish the role and value of the news. Newsweek is gone. Time Inc., which includes Time, Fortune, People, and Money magazines, is surviving, but is now, according to one media critic, quote, the tattered print unit, unquote, of Time Warner's vast entertainment holdings and may be spun off on its own. Lately, I've been wondering if I were on the cusp of a career choice, would I still choose journalism? <coughs> and what has survived of what I originally wanted from it? My impetus, my impetus from high school and college was to find a way to enter the center of action. I was so bored by office work. I wanted to cover foreign wars, the White House, and report on whatever took me by the throat, murder trials, heavyweight fights, I wanted to interview the people who ran the world and get to know Ava Gardner. I'd never be bored. I wanted to be a reporter, but I also wanted to be a columnist, and I became one as a sophomore in college. I didn't seriously know anything about anything, but I wasn't deterred. I believed I'd discover what I was writing about when I wrote it. I was an early believer in the question E.M. Forrester asked himself, how do I know what I think until I hear what I say? I had no political agenda, no causes no, or movements to advance. I didn't want money or power, didn't want to save the world or run it. I didn't even want to run a newspaper. But I kept becoming an editor ever since college and it was always an offer I couldn't refuse. I worked on starting three newspapers from scratch, an Army Weekly and two dailies in San Juan. One of those in San Juan lasted nine months and the other 49 years. It was great work, great sport, but I never fell in love with the job. Puerto Rico did change me. It immersed me in politics. Working for Time Magazine started it, covering Nixon back from being spat on in Venezuela, and Jack Kennedy looking for support down there for his presidential campaign, tracking the Cuban plutocracy that came to San Juan in exile from the new Castro Revolution following exiled Dominican radicals trying to overthrow dictator Rafael Trujillo with the help of the CIA, and working on a Time magazine cover story about Puerto Rico and its wildly popular governor Luis Munoz Marin, one of the great social democrats of Latin America, and the father of the island's new political status, the Commonwealth, known in Spanish as the Estado Libre Asociado. This venture was a lesson in saturation reporting. I worked with a wonderfully manic reporter named Sam Halper, who never had enough copy. We produced 70,000 words, he mostly, for the cover story, a file the size of The Great Gatsby. A writer in New York reduced it for the cover text to 4,471 words. The rewrite system was in effect at time. Reporters didn't write the finished copy and writers didn't report. This was one of several reasons I never wanted to work for the news magazines. This was 1958. The next year we started, for this, started the San Juan Star, funded by Gardner Coles, the owner of Look Magazine, who was expanding his journalistic empire. The editor-publisher was Bill Dervillier, who'd been covering the White House for Puerto Rico's major daily paper, El Mundo, for 20 years, and now ran a weekly, business, a weekly business newsletter in San Juan. He was a fanatic about press freedom and independence and a terrific newspaper man. He'd been born into the era when newspapers were rapidly partisan in political matters, and that was the prevailing in condition in newspapers throughout the 19th century, and also the way it was right now, right then, in Puerto Rico. But though Dordvillier was a longtime friend and admirer of Governor Munoz's politics, the star did not endorse him 
or anybody a rare and probably unique stance that was a gesture toward press independence and objectivity. But in our first election campaign, 1960, two Catholic bishops in Puerto Rico wrote a public letter to the Catholic flock advising them it was sinful to vote for Munoz, whose administration condoned divorce and birth control. Dovilla wrote a strong editorial against the bishops and we put it on page one. And in subsequent weeks, the, subsequent weeks, the paper carried two dozen more editorials about the circus that ensued. Bill and the Star won a Pulitzer for editorial writing. Munoz was re-elected in a landslide. I came back to Albany for family reasons in 1963 and went to work again at the Times Union, still half time, so I could write a new novel. I'd finished the first one and it was circulating but going nowhere. I found that both Albany and the two newspapers had turned inside out since I'd left seven years earlier. Hearst had bought out Gannett and now the two papers were under one roof with Gene Robb of the Times Union uh, as the publisher of both papers. And Robb was feuding with the Albany Democratic political machine run by Dan O'Connell and Erastus Corning. This hadn't happened since the 1920s when the brand new democratic organization was establishing its control over Albany and, it, and the press objected to the way it was spending money. Dan O'Connell and his minions tried to buy off one of the papers back then but it didn't work. Then they got tough and pressured advertisers and put one paper out of business. Those newspapers, Dan said of the press of that day, are the most un-American thing in the United States. Then the machine changed tactics and used legal advertising as carrot and stick to control the competing papers and that's what I remember from the 1950s. They divided from $50,000 to $300,000 between the two papers and if one paper got out of line with negative coverage of the city or county, the machine controlled both governments They'd withdraw the ads and give the other paper an edge in income. The machine also put city hall and court and police reporters from both papers on the city payroll without objection from any of their editors who were all serious machine Democrats. And so for a generation or more, harmony reigned between press and machine until consolidation of the papers. And then Rob, free of restraint, opened editorial columns and letters to the editor to critical comment and editors stopped squelching or burying stories of police brutality or fraudulent county purchasing practices, 500% markups, no competitive bidding, and much more. When this started, the machine withdrew all its ads from the papers and published them in its own brochure. It also convened grand juries to investigate the press's attack on its integrity. Eight reporters were called to testify 19 times. Rob himself was called to testify 10 times. And one reporter on the Nick News, Ed Swietnicki, was indicted for second degree perjury, not because of his reporting, but because of conflicting testimony to the jury about what he said to his editor. He was tried and acquitted and on and on went the adversarial relationship. It branched out also into other targets, social workers, clergy, civil rights advocates, grassroots organization battling to get the city to upgrade their neighborhoods. And about this time, I arrived from San Juan and started reporting on much of this. We were then in a new age for journalism in America. Alternative newspapers like the Village Voice seemed to be breaking establishment taboos in every issue. They pioneered the reviewing of off-Broadway plays and rock music. They reported on the drug culture, on the newly visible, on the newly visible polymorphous sex life, on transgender lore, on the anti-war movement, and on how to get high smoking bananas. And they reviewed a concert by a naked female cellist with accompanying photo. Street language was being published without asterisks and before long the New York Times started reviewing rock music and the New Yorker came face to face with a four-letter crisis. 
The magazine was about to publish an excerpt from Gabriel Garcia Marquez's new novel, Autumn of the Patriarch, but it contained a word that the New Yorker had never published, and an editor asked the translator, the great translator Gregory Rabassa, if he might substitute the word feces for the offensive noun, the unspeakable noun. Gregory said no. If they wanted the story, they had to take it as it was written. And so they did, and Garcia Marquez thereby broke the shit barrier at the New Yorker. In Albany, there were similar cataclysmic breakthroughs. The newspaper in the forefront of the quest for social justice. A rat-tat-tat of editorials, investigative articles, exposés, attacks on all governments that were lagging in implementing the anti-poverty program, the code enforcement laws on housing, and especially in the slum, the machine playing cozy with slum lords, the neglect of black neighborhoods even to the point of not picking up its garbage. Also afoot was, uh, also was the community organization of protest groups in neighborhoods to propel the city toward improvement. But the machine's response was to fire or to threaten or fire protesters from their city jobs evict them from public housing, cut off their welfare benefits, and more if they kept joining the protesters. I was in the middle of this and wrote a long series on slums and slum lords and another one, another series on housing integration in the whole city and another on the arrival and the ascent of a group of young black men who banded together after one of them, Leon Van Dyke, picketed the labor union a uh, laborer's union all by himself to protest never being hired after six weeks of showing up every day for the job call. They called themselves the brothers and they became a new voice in town, a young black male asserting his visibility. They fought slumlords, fought for jobs, ran for public office, spoke out with strong and challenging language that fr frightened some people, but they changed the minds of a lot of people who hadn't heard that voice before or hadn't listened to it. Bill Rowley, he was one of their supporters and helped them out publishing their newspaper, which came out now and then, called The Liberator. They also created a lot of enemies, the brothers, and the enemies were the machine and the police in the forefront, and they were targeted one by one, the, the brothers, and arrested, beaten, had their headquarters shot up twice or 30 times. Their storefront window broken, and more. And slowly the group faded away. But many of the members continued working in social agencies or government bureaus for civil rights and social justice. It was quite a remarkable diaspora. As to the reporters, I received a lot of hate mail for what I wrote, and people thought I might get thrown in the river, but I never was, and I could swim. Scott Christensen on the Nick News exposed the rampant thievery, fraud, arson, gambling, and much more during the building of the Nelson Rockefeller Plaza, the South Mall. And then he was followed, targeted for seduction, given a job offer that would take him far out of town. But he survived and kept writing. I know one of the state I know that one of the state or federal intelligence agencies placed the reporter on the Times Union staff. He eventually half confessed to me about it. So we were monitored from within and also by photographers and agents who tracked us when we were reporting all these goings on. I've written much about all this in a book called, called o Albany, uh, my expressionistic history of the city, if you're interested in more detail. I also put the brothers and one of the neighborhood matriarchs of the group movement into my last novel, Shango's Beads and Two-Tone Shoes, and so there's that. I've been looking around as I was writing these remarks to see what journalism looks like on the internet, and it's foreign territory to me. Julian Assange as a publisher, Edward Snowden and Chelsea, formerly Bradley Manning, as investigative reporters, and then there's that bicyclist, bis, the bicyclist who was pissed off at cyclists who win by doping themselves. And he interviewed a chemist, wrote a 13,000 word article, 
put it on his blog and sent it out on the internet and brought down the King Kong of bike raising, Lance Armstrong, and his empire along with it. And he didn't even have a newspaper. The urge that I had to be to be a columnist and a penniless critic, that vocation is still realizable. You just keep writing to see what you think, review every movie you see for no money, and blog it all away into outer space. I have hope that newspapers will survive in some form or other, but I can't be sure. And Jeff Bezos' prophecy of them all being gone in 20 years does not seem unreasonable. But I had a prophetic dream a long time ago, and I dreamed that the place I lived in was being taken away. It was all abstract, and I didn't know who or what was doing this or where it was all going or why. It so moved me that I transformed it and put it into the final scene of my first novel, The Ink Truck. Bailey, the protagonist, is a newspaper columnist on strike against his newspaper. The guild, his labor union, buckles under, and the strike looks lost. But Bailey fights on and tries to bleed the truck that arrives with the ink to print the newspaper. But he fails to bleed it, and the strike ends. Bailey doesn't capitulate. He keeps picketing, alone. He goes to the guild room where the strikers held meetings, and it's empty. Furniture gone, nothing there. Even the dust in the closet has been taken away. Bailey, manic and irrepressible, is with two reporter friends, and he asks them a riddle. I know the sound of one hand clapping, he says, but what is the fruit of the fun tree? They're sitting against the wall where a sign used to hang with the order, do not sit here. The sign is gone. Bailey and his friends ponder this, and then they get up and leave. It's a sad ending. I think if I were Bailey, and in some ways I am, I would not despair over all that nothingness. After all, nothing is something. And how do you know what you have until you don't have it anymore? I think Bailey goes back to walking that picket line that no longer exists. I think that's his future. After all, it's the only game in town. Thank you. <laughs>